Welcome, everybody. On behalf of Julian Hawker, the Chair of Medicine in the Department of Medicine, I'm Arne Kumigai, and I'd like to welcome you to a special uh, Citywide Medical Grand Rounds. Uh, this is the Barris Lecture that is uh, coming from uh, Mount Sinai Hospital and the Sinai Health System. And for this, I'll turn it over to the Physician-in-Chief, Dr. Chaim Bell. So Chaim, please take over. Thanks and welcome everyone. Um, this is, uh, this, this is uh, the annual Barris Lecture. And this is about, I think it's the first or one of the few times that we've been able to align it with Citywide Grand Rounds. So it's really exciting that not only it will be uh, seen by quite a few people at Sinai and UHN, but that we're able to broadcast it to the broader University of Toronto uh, Department of Medicine community. Uh, the annual Barris Lecture celebrates Dr. Barnett Barris, who is at Mount Sinai Hospital's first uh, physician in chief when the hospital was brought into the University of Toronto. Uh, Barney was a legend in Canadian medicine. He was a general internist with a renowned clinical acumen. And this, this lecture is one of the premier uh, events in our department every year. Previous speakers have included uh, Rita Redberg, Jerry Kassirer, Deb Cook, Malcolm Gladwell, uh, Andre Picard, and David Bates. Um, so just today, I just wanted to quickly introduce our illustrious speaker. And I wanted to thank um, Jorge Sanchez Guerrero, who is our uh, division head for rheumatology for making the the warm connection to Joanne. So uh, Joanne Manson is, uh, is a professor of medicine and the Michael and Lee Bell professor of women's health at Harvard Medical School. There's no relation, by the way. Uh, <laughs> professor in the Department of Epidemiology and the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. She's also the chief of the Division of Preventative Medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Uh, Dr. Manson is a physician epidemiologist, endocrinologist, and PI or co-PI on several research studies, including the Women's Health Initiatives Clinical Center in Boston, the cardiovascular component of the Nurses' Health Study, the v, uh, vitamin D and omega-3 trial, VITAL, the COCO supplement and, and vitamin, uh, multivitamin outcome study, COSMOS, and the vitamin D for COVID-19 VIVID trial. She also wins the prize for best acronyms. Uh, her primary research interests include randomized uh, clinical trial uh, prevention trials of nutrition and lifestyle factors related to heart disease, diabetes, age-related disorders, and the role of endogenous and exogenous estrogens as determinants of chronic disease. Dr. Manson has received numerous honors, including the AHA's Population Research Prize, the AHA's Distinguished Scientist Award, and the AHA's Research Achievement Award. Elect she's also been elected to the Institute of Medicine of the National Academies of Medicine, uh, membership in the As Association of American Physicians, fellowship in AAAS, the Women in Science Award from the American Medical Women's Association, the Bernadine Healy Award for Visionary Leadership in Women's Health, and the Massachusetts Medical Society Awards in both public health and women's health research. She has more than 1,200 published articles, uh, several books and textbooks, and is past president of the North American Menopause Society. Uh, she's actually one of the most highly cited researchers in the world and was, a, the, was one of the physicians featured in the National Library of Medicine's exhibition, History of American Women Physicians. So please welcome me in, in, um, in, uh, in seeing uh, Dr. Joanne Manson as the, this year's Dr. Barnett Barris Lecture. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Bell, for that very kind introduction. Um, it's wonderful to be here and a real honor to have been invited to give the Barnett Barris uh, lecture. I wish I could be there in Toronto in person, and um, I, I do regret that part of it, but um, hopefully it will be, be okay to do this, uh, do this talk virtually, and eventually I'll, I'll make it to Toronto. So this slide has a brief um, overview of what I'll be discussing. I'm going to review the rationale and the results of VITAL, a large scale randomized trial of vitamin D and the marine omega-3 fatty acids in the primary prevention of cardiovascular disease and cancer. I'd also like to discuss some recent updated meta-analyses of vitamin D omega-3s and these um, outcomes of cardiovascular disease and cancer. I'll also briefly discuss our randomized trial, which is ongoing of vitamin D in reducing severity of illness in COVID-19. 
And we'll talk about which patients are more or less likely to benefit from supplementation with vitamin D or omega-3 fatty acids. So I, I do want to um, mention that VITAL is an investigator initiated trial and to thank <laughs> you um, for the uh, su supporting the trial, being a sponsor of the trial, the National Cancer Institute and the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute are co-sponsors of VITAL and we have additional support from other institutes and agencies at NIH. I'd also like to thank and acknowledge Pharmavite and Pronova Biopharma of Norway and BASF for donating the um, vitamin D and the Omicor fish oil, which is known as um, Leveza as well. Uh, these, these study pills and matching placebos were donated as well as the calendar packaging. And I'd also like to thank Quest Diagnostics um, which measured serum 25-hydroxy-D and omega-3 biomarkers and other biomarkers at no cost to the trial. I want to mention that we do have two concurrent publications on the vitamin D results as well as the omega-3 results in New England Journal of Medicine that were published in late uh, 2018 electronically and in print in early 2019. So those who want more details about these findings uh, can find these two publications. This slide shows the overall design of the VITAL trial. And um, VITAL is a large primary prevention, usual risk, a randomized trial. It has more than 25,000 US men and women nationwide, all 50 states. And it's the largest randomized trial of vitamin D and um, also about the only uh, randomized trial of the omega-3s in true primary prevention, usual risk population. Because as you know, most of the previous randomized trials of the omega-3s have tested um, high risk populations, uh, already a prevalent CBD or multiple CBD risk factors. Um, the men are 50 and older, women 55 and older to make them fairly similar in, um, in risk. And as I'll show you, we had about 50% men, 50% women. Um, it's a two by two factorial design, which means that we are separately randomizing to each intervention, allowing us to look separately, independently at the effect of the vitamin D and of the omega-3s, as well as to look jointly at whether there's a synergistic or interactive effect. So we're testing 2,000 IUs a day of vitamin D, and the EPA DHA is a, the omega-3s are one gram a day in approximately a 1.2 to one ratio of the EPA to DHA. The median treatment period was 5.3 years. The trial ended the intervention phase, um, in December of 2017. Uh, so we're now in a post-intervention follow-up period. We were very pleased to have racial ethnic diversity in this trial. We have more than 5,100 African-Americans and I'll, I'll go into a little more detail about that. Um, the specific aims of VITAL, um, the primary aims were to test whether vitamin D3 and or omega-3 fatty acids reduce risk of two parallel primary endpoints of major CBD events, a composite of MI, stroke, and CBD death, and, and total invasive cancer. The secondary aims were to test whether these agents lower the risk of individual endpoints of MI, stroke, CBD death, or an expanded composite that includes major CBD events plus coronary revascularization, PCI plus cabbage. Um, we also have a secondary aim to test whether these agents lower risk of site-specific cancer and total cancer mortality. Another secondary aim pre-specified was to look in key subgroups, including by age, sex, race, ethnicity, and nutrient status at baseline. 
Now I'm going to begin with the omega-3 findings because the results are a little more straightforward for the omega-3s. So mechanism-wise, I think you're all aware there are multiple hypothesized mechanisms. Some are, have been better established than others, many of them operating through icosanoid and inflammatory pathways. So a really key um, effect of the omega-3s is to reduce inflammation. But at high doses, as you know, um, the omega-3 fatty acids do reduce triglycerides. Also some benefits in terms of nitric oxide induced endothelial relaxation. There's a very um, interesting effect on cardiac arrhythmias where there's evidence for reduction in ventricular arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death, but an actual increase in atrial arrhythmias, such as atrial fibrillation, especially with high dose um, omega-3s that was seen in both reduce it and the recent strength trial. Um, so again, decreased inflammation, some effect on blood clotting, decreased um, blood pressure in some studies. There may be some benefits for heart failure. I'll discuss that a little more. And um, decreased plaque progression and increase in plaque stability. So a number of complex mechanisms for CVD prevention. Now, how did this hypothesis even get started that the omega-3s might be cardioprotective? Well, very early on, and we're, we're talking many, many decades ago, there were ecological studies suggesting that there might be an association between higher marine oil intake and a reduced risk of cardiovascular disease, the Greenland Inuit studies, Alaskan Eskimos, some other groups. Uh, actually, recently, some doubt has been cast on these earlier hypotheses, but ecologic studies, as you know, have limitations. But then some prospective cohort studies, more analytic studies were done looking at individuals who have high intake of a fish um, and finding that with a really frequent fish intake, more than five servings up per week versus infrequent intake, the relative risk was substantially reduced for fatal CHD. And also some of these prospective cohort studies did suggest that there might be a reduction in stroke as well um, with, with moderate uh, to high fish consumption. This was one of the reasons why we were interested in looking at both CHD and stroke in the composite endpoint. After um, we began the trial, began recruitment in uh, 2010, 2011, the meta-analyses began to suggest a pattern that most of the randomized trials were really suggesting reductions in coronary events especially in sudden cardiac death and MI, and less so for stroke. Uh, this was not the case with some of the earlier trials, such as uh, GISI and JELUS trial suggested major CVD events were reduced, but it was becoming clearer. And there uh, in the meta-analyses that it was more of a coronary benefit than a stroke benefit. And there have actually been more meta-analyses of the omega-3s than there have been individual randomized trials. So I don't have enough time to go through all the meta-analyses, but by early in our trial, we began to see meta-analyses showing it was more of a coronary than a stroke benefit. And this will be relevant as I go on with the talk. So what was our rationale for the omega-3 dose in vital? So it's one gram a day, 840 milligrams of the EPA plus the DHA in the 1.2 to one ratio. We believed that in a primary prevention setting where of, of course the main tenet would be do no harm. These are people who are generally healthy and you're trying to prevent long-term risk of a chronic disease that we would not wanna test a really high dose that might have risks such as uh, bleeding or atrial fibrillation. So we thought that a dose of one gram a day would represent the best balance of efficacy and safety in primary prevention. And this was actually a substantial dose compared to the current um, health recommendations in the US, which are not that different in Canada. So in primary prevention, the recommendation was about two servings of fish per week, which would be about 250 to 500 milligrams a day. 
in secondary prevention. The American Heart Association had a recommendation of one gram a day. And this dose is about five times higher than average US um, intake. And I believe it's similar in Canada. So this is much higher than average intake. This slide shows the characteristics of the vital study population. So again, we had more than 25,000 participants. The mean age at enrollment and randomization was 67.1. It was uh, 51, close to 51% women. Um, we had racial ethnic diversity, including 20% African-American. We were particularly interested in having um, a large enough sample of African-Americans that we could look very specifically at vitamin D effects in African-Americans. I will talk further about those results in the vitamin D uh, section. But we had other racial ethnic groups represented. And then in terms of other cardiovascular risk factors, it was very much what you would expect in a midlife to older adult primary prevention population of, of volunteers for a randomized clinical trial. Over the 5.3 years of follow-up, we had very good um, retention, morbidity follow was more than 93%, not mortality follow up, including the National Death Index, more than 98%. Our study pill adherence was also quite good, um, more than 83% over uh, 5.3 years, taking the study pills uh, regularly, at least two thirds of them. And um, this was borne out by our biomarker studies which showed that the plasma omega-3 index was increased by 54% in the active treatment group. And there was a minimal, if any, change in the placebo group, which also suggested that we, we didn't have a lot of people using background, taking background fish oil or um, changing their habits, which was good. Uh, in, in terms of the 25 hydroxy D measure, which you know is the best, um, measure of vitamin D status. We had about 40% increase in the blood level in the active treatment group versus only about a 2% change with placebo. So that was also good news. This slide shows our primary results for omega-3s and cardiovascular disease. And the top half of the slide shows our pre-specified primary and secondary endpoints. Now for our primary composite CVD endpoint of MI stroke CVD death, we had only a small and not statistically significant 8% reduction. Um, however, for our pre-specified secondary endpoint of total MI, which is non-fatal and fatal MI, we did see a 28% significant reduction that held up even after Bonferroni uh, correction. This was actually very similar to what was seen in the reduce it trial with four grams a day of EPA, purified form of EPA for the MI, but nowhere near as large a reduction for the primary um, composite event. Interestingly, we saw no reduction in stroke as was uh, the case in the emerging meta-analyses, and I'll come back to our updated meta-analysis on this, and um, CVD mortality and the composite, including coronary revascularization, were also not significantly reduced. We had some other pre-specified coronary endpoints that were just not primary or secondary, but we were interested in looking separately at angioplasty stent, that was significantly reduced in line with the MI findings. Cabbage, which was a smaller endpoint and more likely to be elective, was not reduced. Fatal MI was reduced. CHD death was on the side of benefit. And for a composite total CHD endpoint, which included MI, coronary revascularization, both PCI and cabbage, as well as fatal a CHD, CHD death, we had a significant um, reduction, 17% reduction. Yeah. This, this slide um, shows the Kaplan-Meier curves for major CVD events and total MI. 
And there are just a few points I want to make. This may be a little difficult to see. The active treatment group is on the bottom. We had completely overlapping curves for the first two, two and a half years. And then for major CBD events, we started to see a little separation with the omega-3 arm doing uh, better, slightly lower risk. With total MI, very interestingly to us, we saw a separation of the curves after one year, one and a half years, and the curves continued to separate over time where there were these differences of lower risk in the active intervention arm. So we did not, as I mentioned, have a significant finding for major CBD events, but for total MI, our nominal p-value was 0 0.003, and after Bonferroni adjustment, it was 0 0.015. Now, some of our pre-specified subgroup findings were also of uh, great interest. We wanted to look at nutrient status at baseline and fish consumption being the largest contributor to omega-3, marine omega-3 intake. We looked at the number of fish servings per week reported on our dietary questionnaire and cut it right at the median, which was 1.5 servings per week, less than the median versus greater than or equal to the median. And it was interesting to us that for major CBD events, now again, this is our primary endpoint. Those who had below the median intake of fish did have a significant reduction in the pri our primary CBD endpoint, a 19% reduction those above the median had no reduction whatsoever. And this was a significant interaction p-value. Um, we did not see significant interactions by other variables such as age, sex, or race. Well, I'll talk about race ethnicity for MI where there was major interaction. We didn't see for age, sex, um, statin use, aspirin use, triglyceride levels at baseline, we did not see significant interaction. It was only with uh, the nutrient status fish consumption at baseline. Now for myocardial infarction uh, specifically shown on this slide, we again saw interaction by nutrient status, fish servings, uh, uh, fish consumption. Those who had less than the median, had a 40% lower risk of MI with omega-3 supplementation. Those with <clears throat> more than the median, the median or above had only a, a, a modest 6%, not significant reduction. This was significant interaction. Interestingly, and something we wanna explore much uh, further during the uh, follow-up period is an interaction that we saw with race ethnicity. Um, we had a very strong reduction in African-American and black participants with 77% lower risk of MI with the omega-3s um, as opposed to placebo. I mean, the numbers of events are small. However, this was highly uh, statistically significant and the interaction by race ethnicity was quite strong at 0 0.001. And there, there are some known um, differences in metabolism of omega-3s by race, ethnicity that we're going to be exploring further with genetic studies and biomarker studies. We also saw that the number of cardiovascular risk factors was a modifier. Those who were completely free of CBD risk factors did not benefit. Those who had two or more risk factors had a 43% lower risk with the, of MI with the omega-3s. And again, that was um, a significant interaction, but we saw no interaction by age, sex, statins, aspirin use, or baseline triglyceride levels. Now, I wanna just compare this to the Reduce It trial with icosapen ethyl or the CEPA, as you may know, that, that trial had very dramatic reduction in their primary endpoint of CVD, which was an expansive endpoint of CVD death, MI stroke, coronary revascularization and stable angina. They had a 25% reduction overall. That was highly statistically significant. There's seven zeros after the decimal point there. Um, so this was four grams of a highly purified EPA and uh, that actually did confer major, uh, was associated with major reductions in the primary endpoint, but similar reductions to vital in terms of MI specifically. 
Now, why would the uh, results for vital and uh, other trials of omega-3s, as you'll see, and reduce it uh, differ so much? Well, reduce it being four grams a day, that is the dose that's really recommended for triglyceride lowering, was much more effective at triglyceride lowering than the one gram a day. So we saw about a 6% significant reduction in triglycerides in vital and reduce it saw about a 20% reduction in triglycerides. Um, interestingly, in terms of the LDL cholesterol, most of the omega-3 trials that include DHA, if it's a combination of EPA, DHA, there tends not to be a reduction in LDL because there's some counter action um, of the DHA in terms of LDL lowering. Um, so there was significant lowering of LDL and reduce it, but not in vital. And in terms of CRP and effects on inflammation, reduce it uh, did show a decrease overall in the um, CRP, but in vital, we saw this um, lowering of CRP only in those who had low fish consumption at baseline. Now we have uh, published very recently in, in mid-2019, we published an updated meta-analysis of omega-3s and cardiovascular disease that included not only vital and reduce it, but also the ASCEND trial that had just recently been published. And um, looking at MI specifically, I'll show you stroke and our dose response gradient analysis. Um, there is evidence for a small but significant reduction in MI. If you look at all of the omega-3 trials together, the hazard ratio overall is 0 0.92. This is excluding reduce it because reduce it is an outlier. Um, but this is a significant <coughs> reduction based on the other omega-3 trials. And you can see they're mostly on the side of benefit. When you include reduce it, the hazard ratio is 12% reduction in MI. So there, there is a signal there for MI reduction. Now, as I mentioned, there really is no signal for stroke for any trial except reduce it. So this is very interesting to us that the omega-3s at more moderate doses or, or EPA plus DHA really do not reduce stroke. However, of the high dose EPA, used in reduce it did reduce stroke with a hazard ratio of 0 0.73. So similar to what was found for MI. And um, I, I think that this is really worth delving into. Why is why does EPA, high dose EPA lower stroke, but the other omega-3 um, interventions that have been tested do not lower stroke. Now we did a dose response um, analysis we did not have heterogeneity across the trials in terms of a dose response a gradient. So we were able to include, reduce it in this analysis. And what you can see is that there is significant um, dose response gradient for every one gram increase in dose of EPA plus DHA, there is a 9% reduction of total CVD. Some of this is driven by the higher dose trials, such as um, Reduce It shown here. I mean, that's sorry, Reduce It is over here. And then the Jealous trial shown here. However, um, the other trials are also on this slope and there was no significant heterogeneity. So this um, dose response gradient is uh, valid, but, you know, based on those factors. Now I'm going to shift gears, but come back at the end to guidelines and you know what might be recommended in terms of omega-3s as well as vitamin D. Now, in terms of vitamin D, as you well know, we have both endogenous uh, synthesis through sun exposure, UVB exposure. We make vitamin D in the skin. We also can get vitamin D exogenously through fortified dairy products, some natural foods such as uh, fatty fish, or we can take it through supplements. Um, again, mechanistically, there are many different mechanisms for both cancer and CVD prevention. I will talk a little more about cancer in terms of vitamin D, but also CVD. Um, many of these mechanisms um, are 
you know, more postulated than really well established. I would say many are inconsistent in the um, epidemiologic and clinical trial literature, but for vitamin D for CBD prevention, some evidence for inhibiting cell proliferation, inducing apoptosis, cell differentiation. Also very interesting for what I'll be presenting in terms of our results. Vitamin D has been shown in animal studies and some cell culture studies to inhibit angiogenesis and metastasis. And this may be relevant to some of the clinical findings. There are effects on immune modulation, inhibiting inflammation. Uh, some, some trials suggest regulation of blood pressure, glucose metabolism, and inhibiting vascular smooth muscle proliferation, all of which would be relevant to CBD prevention. Now, every day, um, it's, it's almost every day, at least every week, you know, you hear in the media about another published study showing that a low vitamin D blood level was associated with an increased risk of a chronic disease, cardiovascular disease, cancer, type 2 diabetes. But I just want to highlight that correlation does not prove causation because there are so many potential sources of confounding in the observational studies of 25 hydroxy D blood levels and their association with these outcomes. And it's possible that the uh, 25 D is more of a marker for other factors, such as poor nutrition. If you have poor nutrition, low dietary intake of vitamin D, you may have low intake of fruits, vegetables, and fish, and other healthy foods. If you have a high body mass index and greater adipose mass, this is associated with lower vitamin D because vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin, is sequestered in the fat tissue. And so there's a correlation here with lower 25D and those with higher BMI. And we know higher BMI is a risk factor for these conditions. Also in those who are physically active, they may be less likely to be outdoors, getting sun exposure. So if you're physically active, you, know, you might tend to be walking outdoors, um, hiking, playing racket sports, playing tennis and other sports outdoors, you're gonna get incidental sun exposure. But physical activity, we know is strongly protective for CBD cancer, type two diabetes. So it could be that we just have residual confounding by these and other factors. Also chronic disease is a negative acute phase reactive. So chronic disease itself lowers 25D similarly to the way it lowers albumin. Now, what does the um, Institute of Medicine recommend? Um, and as you know, these are guidelines for both the United States and Canada. Um, and their recommendation, uh, the, the most recent were in 2011, for uh, dietary allowance um, and the tolerable upper intake level. This is mostly based on bone health because that was the only outcome that the IOM felt was really well established to be related to vitamin D. Um, the RDA is defined as covering the needs of at least 97.5% 97 of the population in the absence of sun exposure. So this is in winter, even during the winter in Antarctica, uh, the amount of vitamin D that would be required for bone health and um, they concluded that up to age, for adults up to age um, 70, even some older children, 600 IUs a day met the needs for bone health for 97.5% of the population. And for ages greater than 70, 800 IUs a day met bone health needs. Now, this, of course, is viewed by many clinicians as being way too low. Um, the tolerable upper intake level, which is defined as the level above which there's risk of adverse events, was set at 4,000 IUs a day. So you might see it as as long as you're between 600 or 800 and 4,000, any of these doses should be okay, um, shouldn't lead to toxicity or, or risk, and should meet bone health needs. In terms of, um, but, but keep in mind, the research uh, in terms of safety is mostly for lower doses and not a whole lot on long-term safety of higher doses. Um, in terms of the recommended 25 hydroxy D level, the IOM said anything above 20 nanograms per mil or 50 nanomoles per liter, 2.5 to one ratio here, 
um, would be uh, sufficient for bone health needs. Though many clinical labs recommend much higher than this, at least 30 nanograms or um, you know, 75 nanomoles. Um, and the tolerable upper intake level was set at 50 nanograms or 125 nanomoles per liter. So, so you can see there's quite a disconnect between what many, uh, what many clinical labs are recommending as a normal range and also what many clinicians are recommending for their patients. But um, we, we were testing 2,000 IUs a day, which led to um, an average uh, achieved blood level of over 100 nanomoles per liter and um, more, than, uh, more than 75 na na nanograms, uh, I'm sorry, more than 40 nanograms per mil and more than 100 nanomoles per liter. So we're definitely getting uh, to the amount that would be uh, where the clinical labs, what the clinical labs are recommending. And um, I'm going to show our findings first for cancer, um, it, it, just to mix things up a little and <laughs> keep you on your toes. So starting with total invasive cancer, we, did, we had um, a modest but not a significant reduction. However, for cancer death, we did see a signal of a reduction. And this signal has been seen in other trials as well, as I'll highlight. Um, it was not significant in the overall follow-up period, but it did become significant in our late pre-specified latency analyses that we would require at least two years of treatment and then look at effects on cancer death. And there we saw a 25% significant reduction. We did not see a benefit for all-cause mortality but everything looked a little better after accounting for latency, especially cancer death. These are the Kaplan-Meier curves for cancer incidence. A little benefit started to be seen, but it took three and a half, four years. This is what happens in cancer trials. You don't get, you know, during the first couple of weeks, a benefit for cancer, you know, incidence and diagnoses. Uh, for cancer mortality, we started to see separation of the curves after about three years. And then they fairly substantially separated with a lower risk in the active vitamin D um, group. Again, after excluding the early follow-up, it was a 25% reduction, which was a nominal p-value of 0.024. Now, what have the randomized trials overall shown? We, we did a meta-analysis here that included vital and the earlier trials that had looked at cancer death, there really are only five large scale trials that have looked at this. Four out of five have shown the signal for cancer death. And if you take them all together, the hazard ratio 0.87, which is a p-value of 0.005. The only trial that did not show a reduction was the New Zealand um, VITA trial, which, which was bolus, very high dose vitamin D, um, bolus dosing every month, but the, uh, and, but the, um, the trials that were testing daily intake tended to show a reduction in cancer death. Now, what were some of the subgroup findings? Interestingly, we did see the signal here. It was not quite significant for African-Americans doing better in terms of total invasive cancer, some 20, almost 23%, but not significant reduction. What we found, which we think needs further follow-up and is quite intriguing, is that there may be an interaction by adiposity and by body mass index. And this has now been seen for a number of outcomes that vitamin D supplementation, the bioactivity may be attenuated by adiposity. There, there could be a number of reasons for this, but we found that in those who had what's you know, falling in the category of normal weight, healthy weight, BMI below 25, we had a 24% reduction in the primary outcome of total invasive cancer and no reduction in the higher BMI groups. This was a strongly significant interaction test. And we didn't see an interaction by the 25D, the baseline 25D level, looking at less than 20 nanograms versus 20 or more. It's the same result. We saw no modifying effect 
of age or sex, it was really BMI. Now, we also saw this for cancer mortality, where we had the 0.83 overall. We saw those who had a BMI in that normal healthy range had a marked reduction in cancer death with uh, vitamin D supplementation, 0.58, 42% lower risk that was significant. And the P4 interaction was significant, only a modest, non-significant reduction in the overweight group and no reduction in the obese group. Um, now, this has this interaction by body mass index was also seen, you may recognize it as having been found in the D2D trial that was published also in 20, was published in 2019, presented at the American Diabetes Association meeting. Um, the overall results were not significant for, a, uh, this was 4,000 um, IUs a day of vitamin D3 of a 2.5 year follow-up, overall results 0.88. But in those who were not in an obese BMI, there was a significant reduction in type two diabetes with vitamin D supplementation, and there was nothing going on for higher BMI. Now, we and others have subsequently done meta-analyses for type two diabetes, and vitamin D supplementation and type two diabetes, and are finding that higher doses you know, at least above 1,000 IUs a day do lower the risk of type 2 diabetes, but it's only in those who have BMIs below 30. There's nothing going on in those who have higher BMIs. This has now been seen in two meta-analyses where there's been significant interaction by BMI. Now, whether this is because, you know, the inflammation that's going on or other effects um, associated with higher adiposity are just interfering with vitamin D receptor function or vitamin D gene expression or, or you know, metabolite changes, whatever, it is not well understood, but it seems to be a reasonably consistent finding. Now, what about vitamin D and cardiovascular disease? Really no reduction for any of these outcomes and no modifying effect, age, sex, BMI, or baseline 25D levels. Again, a meta-analysis of more than 21 trials, overall more than 83,000 participants looking at vitamin D and cardiovascular disease showed a pooled hazard ratio of 1.00 for total CDD. So um, this, is, uh, this is now really, really well established that vitamin D is just unusual a risk population is just not, and nor in high risk population is just not lowering the risk of cardiovascular disease. Now, why might it be that vitamin D is looking promising for cancer, especially in those of healthy weight um, or with longer term follow up, and especially looking at cancer death, but doesn't show anything for cardiovascular disease? Well, it may be because of the dose response curve. If you look at the observational studies, it looks like the higher you get with the 25 hydroxy D up to about 40, 40, 45 nanograms per mil. So you're well above hundred nano, nanomoles that there continues to be a reduction in cancer. However, for cardiovascular disease, it really falls off very quickly. You're sort of at major risk once you get to 20 nanograms. So in some ways, this is similar to bone health where it requires very little vitamin D in order to have sufficient uh, sufficiency and maybe supplementation doesn't provide additional benefits. And it, it may be just teleologically that for certain outcomes like cardiovascular, you just need a very modest amount of vitamin D that you can get easily from sun exposure. You don't need fortified foods. <laughs> um, but for cancer, which is you know really much more common in, in recent centuries, um, there does seem to be more of a dose response curve. What else should we learn from vital? Well, over uh, 5.3 years of treatment, <coughs> there were no significant uh, side effects with either agent no increased risk of hypercalcemia with 2,000 IUs a day of vitamin D, no increased risk of bleeding with a gram a day of omega-3s, and, and no significant increase in atrial fibrillation as well. No increase in GI symptoms with either agent. 
stay tuned for some additional ancillary studies that will be coming from VITAL. We will be in the near future reporting on cognitive function, our final diabetes results, hypertension, heart failure preliminarily, some benefits for recurrent heart failure, lung, lung um, outcomes, respiratory disease outcomes, we'll be uh, reporting in detail on bone health and um, diabetes, kidney disease, mood, mental health, infections, macular degeneration, and anemia. So in conclusion, um, for vital, um, neither the omega-3s one gram a day nor vitamin D 2000 I use a day significantly reduce the primary endpoints of major CBD events or total invasive cancer. However, there were some really intriguing signals that are biologically highly plausible. So for the omega-3s, total MI, non-fatal plus fatal was reduced by 28% with a significant nominal and bumperoni adjusted p-value. The greatest um, reduction was in those with low fish intake with lower nutrient status and in African-Americans, which needs further study. PCI, fatal MI, total CHD were also composite CHD were also reduced, but no reduction in stroke, which interfered with the ability to see a reduction in a primary composite endpoint that included stroke. For vitamin D, the signal for reduction in total cancer mortality was seen, especially after account, accounting for cancer latency, and, and this is consistent with other trials. Now, reduce it trial, icosapenethyl um, at four grams a day, there was an, a, a significant reduction in their primary outcome, CVD outcome, 25% reduction, and they also saw a reduction in stroke. So this really needs to be um, delved into much more deeply. The updated meta-analyses um, of, uh, of, of, let's say, EPA and uh, of CHD, omega-3s, and CBD show that there is a reduction in coronary events and CBD with the omega-3s with a dose response gradient. But overall, there's no reduction in stroke, but EPA may reduce uh, CBD risk more than DHA. A and also, I, do I don't have here, but um, the meta-analyses are showing a reduction in cancer death with vitamin D. What can we say in terms of clinical and public health implications? Well, for pri this is primary prevention and usual risk uh, prevention. So for the omega-3 fatty acids, the recommendation would still be encouraging fish consumption to get the marine omega-3s, at least two servings a day. And this would also replace less healthful foods. In those who have low fish consumption who really don't like fish, and there are people who just don't like to eat fish, um, especially if they have risk factors for cardiovascular disease, we do think it would be reasonable to discuss an omega-3 supplement um, with their clinician, whether they might be a candidate based on the available research. And if they're vegetarian or vegan, they can't take a, um, a fish oil supplement, but they, they perhaps could take an algae-based supplement. And I think we do need replication trials in high-risk primary prevention where we had particularly promising findings for um, the omega-3 intervention. Um, vitamin D, really no clear change from the IOM National Academy 2011 guidelines. There's really no clear indication for cardiovascular disease prevention. I think we need more research on cancer. However, the findings are quite promising for cancer death and people um, who have a high, uh, like family history cancer, high risk cancer, yeah, it's quite reasonable. Um, for them to be taking a moderate dose of supplementation, 1,000 to 2,000 IUs a day. I, th I think we need individual clinical decision-making for bone health. Now, people have malabsorption disorders, may need much higher doses than what the IOM recommends. And uh, the IOM always allowed for clinical uh, latitude and decision-making based on um, the clinical health problems of the patient. But an important message is to avoid mega dosing for vitamin D. There are risks and there really are no clear benefits of getting doses that are 
clearly above the um, four to 4,000 I use a day. Stay tuned for vital extended follow-up and ancillary study results. And we are um, hoping to have additional research on high dose EPA, especially in African-Americans. I'll mention briefly that we are doing this um, vivid trial vitamin D for COVID uh, trial. It's a pragmatic cluster randomized design to look at high dose vitamin D. Um, it's still, a, 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 it's 10,000 I use a day loading dose, but 3,200 I use a day uh, maintenance dose in lower and severity of symptoms. And I'd like to end by thanking all of the participants around the country in, in VITAL, the more than 25,000 participants, our staff, and all of my VITAL co-authors. And special thanks to Nancy Cook, I'm in Lee, Sammy Omora, um, Ed Giovannucci, Christine Albert, Ed Giovannucci, Walter Willett, and um, my co-PI, Julie Burring. And thank you so much for your attention. And I'll show this uh, last slide at this point for submitting questions. Um, thanks, thanks very much, uh, Joanne, for the uh, what a tour de force and some really rigorous and work that's probably taken you, you. You glossed over how long it actually took you to put in, but but rest assured, I'm sure this this is decades of hard work and and perseverance that sort of you know, people sometimes see a table and not recognize how much work and, and background work goes into it. These are, these are amazing studies and really some of the best we've ever had in this field. So I really wanna thank you. And you also confirm my initial thing is to eat fish almost every other day. So that's, the, that's one of the things and we won't even talk about the fish haters right now. So um, what I wanted to, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. You tell you people who don't like fish. I don't understand. Yeah, it's about it, 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 even a little bit of fish. Um, but I don't. Um, I just want to take. Uh, we're we're really short on time, so I wanted to talk something. There there are a few things in the chat. I think a couple of people have, have put up their hand. Uh, I'm gonna first go. I think with Francis Shepard because. I think this has to do with. I'm imagining this has to do with cancer. So I'll leave it to friends. Uh, uh, no, it has to do with both cancer and cardiovascular risk. Uh, what I kept listening for and not hearing was corrections for smoking. And during the studies, as these people were coming in and being evaluated, did any of them actually get counseling or did they reduce their cigarette consumption uh, or stop smoking? Because th the, smoking is the hugest risk for cancer and cardiovascular disease. Right, so um, there was no modifying effect of smoking and our trial was not a smoking cessation trial. <laughs> we had our hands full testing vitamin D and omega-3 with 25,000 participants. Um, we frequently had newsletters to the study participants where we talked about ways to reduce cardiovascular risk. We often talked about the importance of not smoking, smoking cessation, but this wasn't a behavioral trial. This was a randomized trial of a supplement that was sent in calendar packs by mail to participants around the entire country. So it would not have been feasible to have provided major behavioral interventions with 25,000 participants in this type of, of trial. But I do agree with you, it's an enormous risk factor. And we were always in our newsletters emphasizing the importance of lifestyle factors and behavioral factors to lower cardiovascular and cancer risk. And, and smoking was frequently um, discussed in the importance of smoking cessation. Right, I, I didn't really mean that you should have been doing that as part of the study. I was just meaning that as you presented the demographics and the benefits in the different subgroups, I would have liked to have seen um, whether there were differences or not. Even I guess you're saying there weren't, but I would have liked to have seen the results based on smoking. There, there weren't. Um, and smoking is included in our papers, in our manuscript as a modifying, of, you know, looking in terms of the subgroups of never smokers, past smokers, current smokers, there was no modifying effect for either the vitamin D or the omega-3 supplement in terms of uh, smoking. And, and also smoking was 
perfectly balanced by randomization. So we had no confounding whatsoever by, by smoking. Smoking actually was on my slide um, of the baseline uh, characteristics. So current smoking was 7.2% um, on my slide 13, showing the baseline characteristics. So I did present that. Thank, uh, so thanks so very that's much. interesting, yeah. The, a low level, low level in this study. Yeah, they're definitely a low level in the private yes, prevention. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just one other question. I'm just going to squeeze in because it's also a plug for um, what's happening next. And we're really happy. So Alana Wiseman is one of our early career researchers here at Sinai. Um, and it also reminds me that Joanne is going to be speaking with some of the early career researchers as if she were here in a room, but it's a virtual room uh, just as part of the uh, as part of the visiting professor. Um, Alana was asking about some concerns regarding the choice of placebo in Reduce It. Uh, can you comment on if the placebo in vital differed uh, compared to reduce it and whether that could explain some of the differences? So our placebo was different. We actually used olive oil. Um, so certainly would not have expected our placebo to have been risky or, or what, whatsoever as has been proposed for mineral oil. Um, the amount of olive oil, though, was really too small to have expected a benefit. So we think it was a good placebo. Um, it was less likely, you know, to become rancid than a lot of other oils that could be used. So we, we wanted to, um, to test a placebo that would not become rancid uh, over time. And, uh, you know, it has been proposed that the mineral oil placebo in Reduce It contributed to the large benefits seen in the trial. It would be very nice to see another trial of icosapent ethyl with a different placebo. So I will make that uh, comment. I think it's a raging controversy right now how much the, uh, placebo, the mineral oil placebo in Reduce It contributed to those favorable findings. And um, all, all I can say is that I would really like to see additional studies of icosapent ethyl using um, a, a different placebo and, and then we would know more, more definitively. Thank you. Thanks, Joanne. And I'm just gonna cut it, cut it for time, but I really wanted to thank Joanne to remind everyone, thank you for the, this is a citywide grand round to remind everybody to complete their evaluation forms uh, as well as uh, for sign up but really want to thank and acknowledge Joanne as this year's Barney Barris lecturer and visiting professor, uh, virtually visiting professor, uh, for an amazing e explanation and um, just taking us on a tour of the world of randomized trials and primary prevention, uh, wh which is really important. And uh, the, you know, the amazing thing is that this is fodder for many, many more studies to come. So it answered a lot of questions but it also raised a lot of questions and it shows that uh, a trialist work is never, never done. So really thank you, thank you, appreciate it very much. And uh, thank you for everybody for uh, listening and, and watching. Well, thank you so much for the invitation and it's, it was great talking with everyone this morning, this afternoon, the time is <laughs> Great, thanks very much. Thanks, we'll give it the wave.